Vatican II. So Vatican II can be a little hard to talk about. The reason is because Vatican II is still so recent, as I'm sure you guys know, so steeped in controversy, so all-encompassing. And honestly, we're still kind of in the process of implementing it. And as we're soon going to find out, the initial implementation efforts of this council did not go smoothly. And at this point, it's kind of fallen to our generation of Catholics to better understand its true meaning and to implement it like the council fathers originally intended, which will hopefully finally allow our church to engage with the modern world and take us into the future. This is Reclaiming Vatican II. But first, like any good presentation, what set the stage for Vatican II? All right, so obviously the reason that we call it Vatican II is because before that there was a Vatican I, right? So from 1869 to 1870, the first Vatican Council met. And the most important thing to come out of this was defining the doctrine of papal infallibility, which means that the Pope is considered infallible when he's officially speaking from his office as the successor of Peter on doctrines of faith and morals. That was kind of the single core thing to come out of Vatican I. But the crazy thing about Vatican I is it was a truncated council because in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War broke out and the Kingdom of Italy basically occupied Rome, which made the Pope sort of a captor with uh, a captive, sorry, within the Vatican for a little while while the whole political situation was being worked out. So the F First Vatican Council was very short and actually the First Vatican Council didn't officially close until the beginning of Vatican II. The church was in kind of an interesting state at this time in church history. So for a lot of church history, the church was like very intertwined with secular political authority. These secular political authorities often had as much influence on the church as the church had on them. For instance, a lot of kings that the church was tied with often had a say in appointing bishops inside of the church. So like even though the Pope still kind of had to give the official approval for the appointing of bishops, there was sort of like this back and forth between the church and secular political authorities. And now this was no longer the case by this point in church history. The church had kind of become a basically self-governing institution all on its own. And because of the doctrine of papal infallibility, the Pope kind of had more power than ever within the church. So it just made for a different dynamic within the church than um, we were probably used to before. The other very obvious thing that had happened over the past 400 years is that the world was just becoming less and less Catholic. Protestantism and now secular modernism had taken over large parts of the world. And the church's response to this was to kind of take an extremely defensive and insular position against it. So the Protestant Reformation had happened about 400 years earlier. And right before that time, the church was sort of the dominant force in the Western world, especially during the high Middle Ages. And throughout these past 400 years, the church had seen itself kind of gradually losing and losing influence within the world, especially with the spread of Protestantism, and then especially in the 19th century with the spread of secular modernism because of new modern philosophies that we, we were becoming really popular at that time. The church's kind of main tactic to combat this was to sort of like wall up within itself. It became very insular at the time. As one person put it, it kind of crouched behind its medieval walls. It became its own thing. And the only way it really tried to engage with the world around this time was to sort of condemn the heresies of the world. So it would often issue things like, for instance, Pope Pius IX's 1864 Syllabus of Errors that would just explain, yeah, these are all the heresies that are happening in the modern world. But there was no real attempt by the church to really try to engage this kind of new ways of thinking that had kind of taken over the world. There were other issues in the church at this time as well. Much of the laity was kind of alienated from the sacraments, especially the mass. A huge part of the laity, if they were attending mass at all, 
had no real idea what was going on during it and weren't at all engaged. They kind of largely just prayed silently through most of it as the priests were sort of in the sanctuary in the front having the mass in Latin spoken lower so most people couldn't even hear it, not that they spoke Latin anyway. And there was just like a disconnect between what the priests were doing and what the people were doing. And and people's attendance at mass kind of tended to be sitting there killing time with different prayers and devotions that they had until communion time, basically, if they would even receive, because a lot less people used to receive back then. The other thing is that the faith lives of a lot of people were sort of wrapped around devotions to particular saints. And for a lot of the laity at the time, that was sort of like their whole faith life. Like they had devotions to these very specific saints, but they weren't really engaged with the sacraments at all. And they weren't really engaged with our church calendar that goes through sort of the incarnation and then the past past passion and death of Christ, there was just kind of a separation in knowledge between the laity and the the priest. And there were things like the liturgical movement, um, which started in Belgium in the early 20th century and eventually kind of spread throughout the world. That was kind of a deliberate effort to get the laity more engaged with the sacraments again. That's where a lot of encouragement for things like hand missiles at church became really popular. It was kind of an attempt to say, you know, this dynamic that we have going now where the laity don't know that much about what's going on is kind of a unhealthy dynamic. Actually, a lot of the ideas of this 20th, 20th century liturgical movement were brought into the Second Vatican Council. The other thing is, um, and it's hard to understand this perspective as an American sometimes, but in Europe, the 1950s weren't exactly what they were here. So like here we think of the 1950s as like this golden age in America, right? The war was over. The men had returned home. The economy was good. People's lives were generally happy. Suburbia was blowing up. Even things from the Catholic perspective, like Fulton Sheen was on TV. The Baltimore Catechism had come out and was a very popular teaching tool. We definitely tend to romanticize the 1950s here in America. But in Europe, it was a completely different story. They had just gotten the brunt of two back-to-back -back world wars, and it left them weary, devastated, and worst of all, cynical. The spiritual lives of a lot of Europeans was pretty desolate. There's a lot more history that predates the Second Vatican Council, but in the essence of time. In 1962, Pope John XXIII opened up the Second Vatican Council to address many of the issues I just described. And he's quoted here at the opening address, what is needed at the present time is a new enthusiasm, a new joy and serenity of mind in the unreserved acceptance by all of the entire Christian faith without forfeiting that accuracy and precision in its presentation which characterized the proceedings of the Council of Trent and the First Vatican Council. What is needed and what everyone imbued and what everyone imbued with a truly Christian, Catholic, and apostolic spirit craves today is that this doctrine shall be more widely known, more deeply understood, and more penetrating in its effect on men's moral lives. What is needed is that this certain and immutable doctrine to which the faithful owe obedience be studied afresh and reformulated in contemporary terms. For this deposit of faith or truths which are contained in our time-honored teaching is one thing. The manner in which these truths are set forth with their meaning preserved intact is something else. So the Second Vatican Council was called. In, on October 11, 1962 by Pope John XXIII. Interesting about this council was it was definitely larger than any church council in history had been. All bishops of the world were allowed to be present to speak and to vote as council fathers. Almost 2,600 bishops attended, so it easily made this the largest council in church history. And if you see kind of the faded background of my slide here, there were basically benches built right within St. Peter's Basilica 
that sat everybody during the council sessions. 2,600 bishops, numerous theologians, plus for the first time over 63 Protestant, Orthodox, and Jewish religious leaders were invited, as well as 52 lay men and women observers. Obviously, the representatives of these other faiths and the lay people didn't have the voting power or really couldn't participate like the council fathers could. But just having them there was sort of a representative of what this council was looking at. The Second Vatican Council met over four sessions and produced 16 documents in total, including four sacred constitutions. These are the most important documents. Sacrosanctum Concilium, Lumen Gentium, Dei Verbum, and Gaudium et Spes. And these are the ones we're going to be taking a look at a little bit later. Um, There were also nine decrees. My Latin is not nearly good enough to run through all of these, but uh, you can tell that this was a very all-encompassing council, right? On bishops, on priestly ministry, on priestly formation, even on the Eastern churches, on missions, on the media. The Second Vatican Council really wanted to address everything. And then there were these three declarations on non-Christian religions, on religious freedom, and on Christian education. All of these, if you guys are curious, are available to read on the Vatican website. If I could recommend, and I'm going to be getting to this later, to read the four constitutions, I bought the Word on Fire Vatican II collection. This book is an amazing way to read these, and it has commentary by Bishop Barron and the post-conciliar popes, so definitely worth checking out. And then the Second Vatican Council formally closed on December 7th, 1965. And Pope Paul VI actually closed this. Pope John XXIII died about a year or so after the Second Vatican Council commenced. So a new pope was elected, Pope Paul VI, Pope St. Paul VI now. And um, he closed the council on December 7th, 1965. So... That's it, right? The Vatican, Second Vatican Council ended. Everything was implemented successfully. And we all know what the council changed, right? The church finally got with the times. No more Latin. We made the priest face the people during the mass. Communion in the hand. No more overly ornate churches. Keeping things simple was the most important thing. Christianity means political activism. Everyone is saved now. Modern mass, modern music at mass, no more Gregorian chant. Mass is no longer a sacrifice, it's a communal meal. Anyone can be a priest. Liturgical dancing, mass on bicycles, clown masses, whatever this is. The 70s were a weird time in the church. As I'm sure you guys uh, are probably getting from that slide right there, All of these things, every single one of those things shown on the slides from the things at the beginning, which you think might have been in the Second Vatican Council, all to this crazy stuff at the end. None of this stuff was ever actually called for by the Second Vatican Council. Not one thing I just listed. It's weird, right? Because like a lot of these things, maybe not these more ridiculous things I have at the end here, but a lot of these things are things that we think about when we think about post-Vatican II changes in the church, right? But if none of these things were called for by the Second Vatican Council, like, where did all of this stuff come from? Why do we think of this stuff as, like, post-Vatican II Catholicism? Introducing this concept known as the Paracouncil. And the Paracouncil was a term coined by French theologian Henri de Lubac, who we'll be coming back to quite a bit, uh, to refer to kind of the poor caricature of Vatican II that grew in the consciousness of the public in the wake of the Council. Also known as the spirit of Vatican II, this was sort of like this vague concept of Vatican II that was pushed by a lot of people in the wake of the Council as a way to kind of push whatever radical reforms people wanted onto the church and especially onto the mass from what you guys can tell. To quote Pope Benedict XVI, and we're gonna be coming back to him a lot because he not only was he present at the Second Vatican Council as Joseph Ratzinger at the time, obviously, but he was a heavily influential theologian on the council, which we'll get to in a second. But to quote Pope Benedict XVI, a vast margin was left open for the question on how this spirit of Vatican II should subsequently be defined and room was consequently made for every whim. 
So Father Blake in his book, uh, Reclaiming Vatican II, kind of points to three councils, the, like fake councils he talks about, which were reasons for this para council that was created. So first off, he calls this first one the Council of the Theologians. There were many radical theologians who had hoped that Vatican II would usher sweeping changes into the church. And they were kind of left disappointed by what the council actually said. These theologians were hoping that Vatican II would be a radical reset for the church that ditched much of the tradition and even the dogma that came before. This led to kind of a rift between these open-minded, free-thinking, progressive academics and the actual church hierarchy. And what happened is a lot of these theologians took it upon themselves to kind of preach their own theologies in parishes, universities, seminaries, and the media under the guise of what Vatican II really meant and that infamous spirit of Vatican II that we talked about earlier. So it was definitely a deliberate effort and it wasn't just sort of like a personal opinion that they had. They kind of made sure that this got out and that they were, and like, they were able to kind of push what they were hoping for onto the church because they felt Vatican II had kind of failed in modernizing the church in this regard. And to quote uh, Henri de Lubac, who has this amazing essay, he wrote this book called A Brief Catechesis of Nature and Grace. And in Appendix C, I think in the back, he has an essay called The Council and the Power Council, which he just lays into what happened after Vatican II. But to quote him, from among certain intellectuals whose faith was not very enlightened, who lacked real culture and were ignorant of history, and were, who were already more or less led astray by the millenarian delusions of our century, the pseudo-conciliar ideology, aided as it was, with a considerable portion of the press, recruited many partisans. We'll get to him more in a second. He was a very influential theologian at the Second Vatican Council, and almost immediately after, he saw the mess that was being made in the wake of this. So there was the Council of the Theologians, then there's the Council of the Media. So Vatican II was the first time a church ecumenical council had ever been covered by the modern media. So think about it. The Vatican I happened in the late 1800s. They didn't have TV or radio or all of the other modern methods of communication that were present by the 1960s. So this was a really new thing for the church. And the media back then was very similar to the media now. Everything was filtered through the lens of secular political journalists, right? Because the journalists in the media didn't really understand the church. You know, like there weren't a lot of practicing Catholics in the media that kind of knew how to interpret such an event. So the media was the media. The only way they knew how to see this was as sort of like this big political event going on. And so they kind of laid out this idea of the council as this sort of battleground between open-minded, free-thinking liberal bishops and these closed-minded, old-timey, stuffy conservatives as sort of like this battle for the heart of a church, of the heart of the church. And those theologians that we had talked about earlier kind of encourage this view. So they kind of fed into this and they would have a lot of interviews with the media where these theologians would say, oh yeah, this is what's going on behind closed doors. And the media was just like, yeah, this is a political event because the church is a political body. The church is above our secular politics, right? Like to look at our church and to think of it as a battleground between sort of like conservatives and liberals and like viewing it through the lens of our secular Western politics. And it's not a good way to view the church. The church is above that. It's more dynamic than that. And it especially doesn't fit into our American categories like a lot of people in America try to fit it into. Uh, but we see it all the time, right? Like whenever you look at the New York Times reporting at the, on the church or even a lot of our Catholic media, you still see this all the time today. And it's just a disaster for, you know, seeing the church as the church founded by Christ, right? And our bishops and our Pope kind of leading the church 
in in that direction. So there's my little soapbox right there. But the point is, no one really like this was the first time that had ever really happened, and it had a big influence on people. So then the third and final council that uh, Father Blake talks about is the Council of the Age. To use this quote, the Second Vatican Council was in peril from its period, which was man-centered, sociologically minded, and spiritually horizontal. There were many anti-Christian cultural changes in the first half of the 20th century, especially, right? Because of all these modern philosophies that had kind of made their way into the collective consciousness, people were pulling away from religion. And the, the culture was definitely shifting away towards traditional Christian values. But then the 60s hit. And remember, this council met from 62 to 65. This was like the heart of the swinging 60s, right? So literally as Vatican II was meeting, the swinging 60s were happening. The sexual revolution, Vietnam, the assassination of JFK, the Cold War, the civil rights movement, you know, all built around rebellion against authority, right? Woodstock, free love. And there was just a lot of cultural changes going on. And the Catholic Church, as the ancient institution it was, was clearly in the firing range of these whole of all of these movements, especially with their sexual ethics and especially with a lot of their teachings that were considered old timey, especially in such a changing period as the 60s. Like I said, literally as the council was happening. And what this kind of did was it made the narrative that we just talked about, right? The narrative that these progressive theologians had that was fed to the media and the media pushed it into the homes of people, right? But this made it so easily swallowed by the culture because the culture was just ready and primed for any sort of a shift away from the way things were before. So without questioning sort of the narrative of what the para council was, it was just kind of swallowed by the culture at the time because that was just the cultural zeitgeist. So it was just kind of this perfect breeding ground for this weird interpretation of the council to just really take root in our society. So to quote Pope Benedict once again, because he's a great perspective on the whole council, the long prepared and ongoing process of disillusion of the Christian, Christian concept of morality was, as I have tried to show, marked by an unprecedented radicalism in the 1960s. Indeed, in many parts of the church, conciliar attitudes were understood to mean, conciliar attitudes, by the way, being like being pro-Vatican II. Conciliar attitudes were understood to mean having a critical or negative attitude so towards the hereto existing tradition, which was now to be replaced by a new, radically open relationship with the world. There were individual bishops even who rejected the Catholic tradition as a whole and sought to bring about a kind of new, modern Catholicity in their diocese. It was clear to at least the people at the council what went on in the wake of the council, but it was just a little muddier for the people on the ground. In opposition to all of this craziness that was going on, you have the traditionalist, right? The tradi sort of Catholic traditionalist movement was founded by French Arch Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, I think is how you pronounce his name. French Ar Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre was horrified at what he perceived to be were the fruits of the council. Even though he was at the council as a council father, and let me point out, signed every single one of the documents, which is interesting. But he was horrified, especially at what this implementation of the council looked like. And he founded the Society of St. Pius X, uh, the SSPX, which is still around today, to ensure the orthodox formation of priests, basically. That was his main concern. And because of his sort of explicit rejection of the Second Vatican Council in the wake of it, there was a lot of tension between the SSPX and the hierarchy of the church because of he seemed to reject the council altogether. Now, I was debating how far into the politics of Catholic traditionalism I wanted to get because there is so much to this story, especially when it comes to like the excommunication of the bishops that he ordained and blah, blah, blah. There's so much to it. It's not really the focus of my presentation. So 
I'm just going to kind of sidestep it. I just wanted to point out that there was this reaction to the para council, basically. And to broadly categorize traditionalists, and if there are traditionalists here, and this seems like a, a misstep of you know what exactly is represented, the, the problem with traditionalism is there's such a range, right? But broadly speaking, traditionalists regard Vatican II as having been such a mess to different extents that the best course of action is to just go back to the way things were before the council. That they kind of see Vatican II as kind of like a failed experiment, right? The church tried to be more open to the modern world. It seemed like the modern world just moved right in. Let's just go back to the way things were before. And there was this sort of counter reaction. So now you sort of have these progressives who are pushing their sort of vision of the council and these traditionalists who are reacting against less so the actual council and more so the para council and you get this dynamic that still exists today when people are dialoguing about the second vatican council all right so i talked a lot about what vatican ii wasn't now we'll get into what the true spirit of vatican ii was can't talk about vatican ii without talking about the nouvelle theology scholasticism was the standard method for philosophy and theology in the church at this time. So scholasticism is basically based on the methods and style of philosophy developed by St. Thomas Aquinas and his successors in the Middle Ages. And throughout, especially the past 400 years, had become basically the standard for how Catholicism was to do philosophy and theology. However, Within that time period, modern philosophies by thinkers like Descartes, Kant, Hegel, and others had pretty much taken over the world. And the way the Catholic Church kind of used excuse me, used scholasticism at this time was sort of as a way of like maintaining their Catholic identity against all odds, right? So we're Catholic, our theological perspective is scholasticism. It's proven through the past 400 years, and we're going to stick hard to this. And there had been issues with modern philosophers in the church who went to really bad places. And so the church kind of pushed back on what they were doing by doubling down on scholasticism. Now, there's no issues with scholasticism in and of itself. However, it wasn't great at sort of dialoguing with what the modern world's philosophies had become by this point. Scholasticism was very sort of based in the Middle Ages, based on ancient Greek philosophy, and it just didn't speak to speakers like Kant and Hegel and, and philosophies that were very much being taken up by the modern world at this time. So there were a lot of theologians who realized that the church needed to move away from scholasticism, but they had to be careful while doing so because the hierarchy of the church at this time was very much enforcing scholasticism as the way to do Catholic theology. So in France and in Germany at this time, this nouvelle theology developed. And this was a movement by theologians in France and Germany in the mid 20th century that sought to develop a theological method that would better speak to the modern world while remaining faithful to the Catholic tradition. This definitely wasn't a unified movement, to be clear. And especially during the council, once it was proven that the Nouvelle Theology was going to be sort of the method that the Second Vatican Council employed, it was became clear that there were a lot of different points of view within the Nouvelle Theology. These guys were kind of grouped together because they were from the same basic parts of the world and they had the same broad view ideas. But once you got really into the heart of the council and especially afterwards when it comes to interpreting it, it becomes clear that these guys weren't all exactly on the same page. But for now, think of them as sort of the collective group. And here on this slide, we have from the top left, Joseph Ratzinger, and then on the right, Henri de Lubach, and then in the bottom left is Hans Urs von Balthasar, and in the bottom right, Marie Dominique Chenu. There were a lot of others that were all present at the council and very influential. And sort of 
broadly speaking, from the Nouvelle Theology, the main methods were these two ideas called ressourcement and aggiornamento. So, ressourcement. This is a great quote. I love this quote. Tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. Love it. So good. So basically the idea behind Source Mont is that Catholic tradition, meaning all of the teachings of the church of the past 2000 years, is sourced in divine tradition, right? What is true from God's from God, right? Therefore, if we return to the sources of our Catholic tradition, it will put us more in tune with God. So since the Council of Trent had ended in 1563, there had been numerous landmark discoveries and advancements in the world. So one of these was the discovery of the Sinai Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls. And these provided far older sources for the Bible than what was the common go-to reference at the time, which was St. Jerome's Latin Vulgate. That was sort of the basis for all of the translations of the Bible at that time. The Sinai Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls were far older which once they started being worked through and new translations of the Bible came out of them, it led to this massive renewal in biblical scholarship, both inside the Catholic Church and in Protestant circles too. It was just this huge thing going on throughout the world. Also, patristics was the other big thing. So patristics, the study of the early church fathers, was also undergoing a renaissance at this time for basically the same reason. So things like the Didache, which was this old, old document from the very, very earliest times of the church, which had been lost for almost a millennia at this point, was rediscovered. Um, and this provided a glimpse into the early church and the way it worked and the way it celebrated its liturgy, which was a whole new perspective that the church hadn't had in over a millennia. Also, the writings of saints like St. John Christendom, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, St. Basil the Great, Origen, all of these were completely unavailable to the fathers of the Council of Trent when it met back in the 1500s. So this gave the church a new perspective of its tradition. So sort of the general idea of Resource Mont is that a more profound appreciation of sacred scripture and patristic teaching could be used to revitalize the church. So that's Resource Mont. The other side of the coin of Resource Mont is aggiornamento. And aggiornamento very simply means bring up to date. Now, to be clear, this is not getting hip or just being progressive or just getting down with the current cultural times, right? This is a whole different thing. Aggiornamento is like the transmission of the eternal truths of the church in new ways that speak to the needs of the modern world. And Pope John the 23rd gave an awesome example that I think really shows what aggiornamento is. So in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul is talking with the Athenians at the Areopagus. And the method he sort of employs to spread the truths of the gospel to them is a great example of, of exactly what is meant by aggiornamento. So to quote Acts 17, then Paul stood up at the Areopagus and said, You Athenians, I see that in every respect you are very religious. For as I walked around looking carefully at your shrines, I even discovered an altar inscribed to an unknown God. What therefore you unknowingly worship, I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all that is in it. Right? So Paul looked at what the Athenians were doing and was kind of, taking note of their shrines. And he understood that their worship was pagan and misguided and not the worship of the one true God, right? But he saw an inherent good in their culture and an inclination towards the truth. He saw that they realized that there was this God that they didn't know a lot about. And Paul was theorizing, you know, this could be them searching after the one true God. So he used that sort of hint of truth in their culture to steer the Athenians towards the full truth of Jesus Christ. So that's the idea, right? 
Aggiornamento is like taking note of the signs of the times and understanding the good and the true that is in the culture and pulling out those truths from a Christian perspective and using them to spread the gospel. You can see this Aggiornamento style in the Vatican II documents, right? So unlike the documents of many previous councils, which were just sort of a list of like dogmas being defined or anathemas, you know, these are heresies. No good Catholic can believe this. Or this is what we believe. The Vatican II documents read like long, they're like essays. They're easily approachable. Anyone can read them, even though they have deep theological truths in them. They're kind of able to be picked up by anybody. And they speak in sort of the style that people talk now. So it's considered more of a catechetical style. It's meant to instruct the faithful in the world, not just sort of issue declarations like previous councils had. All right, so what did Vatican II actually say? The whole reason you guys are here. Okay, so as I mentioned before, I'm gonna focus on the four sacred constitutions of Vatican II, the four main documents from the council. And like I pointed out earlier, those are contained in this book. These are, this book just has the four constitutions in it. It doesn't have all of the other documents. So. Some of these are pretty lengthy, especially Lumen Gentium and Gaudium et Spes are pretty long. And to be clear, this book has a lot of commentary in it too, so it's not quite as long as this is making it seem. They're wordy and lengthy, but they're interesting and easy, fairly easy to read. So like, I highly encourage you guys to actually read them. They're, they're definitely worth it. So the four constitutions of Vatican II. Sacrosanctum Concilium, the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Lumen Gentium, the Dogmatic Constitution on the Church, Dei Verbum, the Dogmatic Constitution on Divine Revelation, and Gaudium et Spes, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. These are the main documents of Vatican II. And this diagram I have here was pulled directly from Father Blake's book. Father Blake kind of talks about the logic of these four documents. So the order I have them listed on the left there was the order that these documents were released by the council. And it proved providential, right? Because there's sort of this logic, right? Where you start with the liturgy and then everything gradually flows out of it, which is very much of our understanding of how the church works, right? So if you look at this diagram, at the heart of it, we begin with the sacred liturgy. It's the church's central activity and the most its most important responsibility. And it's what nourishes and sustains the church. It's through the liturgy that the church's essential nature shines forth. Then the church is directed through divine revelation, which comes from sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which is what Dei Verbum talks about. And finally, under the guiding hands of divine revelation, she's able to evangelize the modern world. And that's what Gaudium et Spes talks about. So I don't actually think it was the intention of the council originally to release the documents in this order, but it proved really providential once they came out. And it's just sort of an interesting logic. That was That's the kind of logic of Vatican II. So without further ado, let's pop into these sacred con these constitutions. The first one being Sacrosanctum Concilium which in Latin means the sacred council, which is like, but this is the document on the liturgy. Like, why is it called that? Apparently, and I just learned this very recently, Vatican documents are named after like literally the first few words at the beginning of them. So if you read Sacrosanctum Concilium, it starts with this sacred council, dot, 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 dot. So even though it's like, this is about the liturgy, it's called the sacred council. All right, Sacrosanctum Concilium, the liturgy. We all love talking about this, right? So to quote Sacrosanctum Concilium, the liturgy is the summit towards which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all of her power flows. From the liturgy, therefore, and especially from the Eucharist, as from a font, Grace is poured forth upon us, and the sanctification of men in Christ, and the glorification of God, to which all other activities of the church are directed as towards their end, is achieved in the most efficacious possible way. Cannot say higher things about the liturgy than that. So to review a little bit of catechesis, I'm sure a lot of you guys already know this. 
the most holy sacrifice of the mass is the most important thing the church does period end of story adoring and glorifying god comes before all else before social activism before evangelization before private prayer devotions anything else the church does if there was only one thing the church could do the sacred liturgy the mass because of course as catholics we believe that the mass is the very same sacrifice that christ offered on calvary but in a sacramental, unbloody manner. It's not symbolic. It's not a replication. It's not simply a thing we do together as a community. It is in front of us, Christ being sacrificed, the very same sacrifice occurring that occurred on Calvary on the cross 2,000 years earlier. And every mass ever said throughout the history of the church is connected together in this mystical way. Throughout the liturgy, Christ allows us to become participants in his greatest act of worship to the Father and in his ministry of reconciliation, right? So the Eucharist is not primarily Jesus's gift to us. It's his sacrifice, which is first and foremost his gift to the Father, right? So through the liturgy, through the Mass, Jesus allows us to become participants in his greatest act of worship to the Father, right? Jesus wants us to participate with him in the thing he does to redeem all mankind, which is just so cool. And like literally why mass can never be boring, right? Like in the most bland, boring mass you've ever been to, like this is what's happening in front of you. The celebration of the mass is for the redemption of mankind and the perfect glorification of God. So Sacrosanctum Concilium and the church in general teaches just how important the sacred liturgy is. And most importantly that it's not just about us going to church to learn things, or it's not about us to come together as a community. Yes, all of those things are there and they're super important, but like at the core, what the mass is, is Christ perfect sacrifice to his father that we're being allowed to participate in. Let me just put it bluntly. The liturgy is not about us. We're participants in it. So it's not that we have no role in it and it, it has nothing to do with us. That's clearly not the case, but it's not primarily about us, right? Like a priest could offer the mass in the middle of nowhere you know, it has been offered by saints and martyrs in jail cells in like the most deplorable, like, like the kind of most measly conditions possible. And it is still Christ glorifying his father. The liturgical reform, right? This is what we all think of a lot of the times when we think of Vatican II. And actually, that is what Sacrosanctum Concilium is about. It's about the council giving direction about what they want out of the liturgical reform that was directed by the council. So Sacrosanctum Concilium directed there to be a restoration of the liturgy. The last major revision was at the Council of Trent 400 years prior when the Roman Missal was officially promulgated and the mass became more or less the same throughout the world. So there are two reasons, two main reasons cited why Vatican II reformed the liturgy. One is that there had recently been a revival of liturgical theology because of the discovery of patristic texts, early church texts. Unlike at the Council of Trent or, you know, a lot of times in, in the past, because of these discoveries of these ancient, ancient documents, we finally had good insight into what the liturgy was like in the early church. And because of that, we're able to kind of reconcile what was happening in the early church with the way we pr practice liturgy now and we're able to restore some practices that just had been lost throughout time. The other primary reason for the liturgical reform was to foster active participation for the faithful. And as I kind of iterate here, active participation was the basic principle of this reform. And now I'm going to do another but not what you think of thing. Active participation 
does not mean, and the council never intended it to mean, lay people doing more stuff during the liturgy, as it was often kind of interpreted by the para council, right? So there was this attitude in the post-Vatican II church that the more people we can get involved in the liturgy and somehow like doing things, the more in line with Vatican II we're being. And that's that's not what the council really asked for. Active participation, a sort of short definition of what the church had in mind when it was talking about it, is to be contemplatively and prayerfully engaged in the liturgical action of the mass. Think about it, right? I had talked a little bit earlier on about how the faithful were like very disengaged from what was going on at the mass prior to this time. And what the church really desired was that the people would be able to become part in some spiritual way of what was happening on the altar, right? That they would be able to comprehend it and be able to, to contemplatively go through it with the priest, right? That it wasn't just the priest doing a thing and we were just kind of doing our own thing, like praying the rosary or whatever devotions we had. We, were, we needed to be engaged in the mass. So I, I think like engagement is kind of a best way of describing active participation. Us understanding what is happening so that we're able to fully spiritually participate in it. Because of what we just talked about with the liturgy, we, by going to mass, should be participants in the action of God himself. To quote Sacter Sanctum Concilium and its sort of directive for this restoration of the liturgy, in this restoration, both texts and rites should be drawn up so that they express more clearly the holy things which they signify. The Christian people, so far as possible, should be enabled to understand them with ease and to take part in them fully, actively, and as befits a community. So, what changed? What did Sacrosanctum Concilium actually ask for in this liturgical change? One, expanded scripture engagement. That was a huge push by the council was to get the faithful to read more scripture. And as part of that, it was to add more scripture into the mass. So the old mass, the mass from prior to Vatican II, only 1% of the Old Testament was read throughout the year and only 16.5% of the New Testament was read throughout the year. So, uh, and in Latin, and mostly from the priest to himself. So, unless you were there following along with the Missal, you weren't even hearing this. So, no wonder there sort of became the stereotype that Catholics don't read the Bible, right? Because such a tiny amount of all scripture was read in the Old Mass, and it was in a language that Catholics couldn't, most Catholics couldn't understand. So Vatican II with the new mass expanded. So instead of a single year cycle, like the old mass had, we now move to a three year cycle for the weekend, for the Sunday masses and a two year cycle for all of the weekday masses. And it expanded it to a whopping 13.5% of the old Testament. Still not like the majority for sure, but better. And then over 71.5% of the New Testament would be read, which is like the vast majority of it at that point. Obviously, one of the big reasons for the Old Testament expansion was that on Sundays now, we have an Old Testament reading as part of our Mass. Whereas in the Old Mass, there was just a single reading even on Sundays, and it was almost always pulled from the New Testament. Really, the only time I think the Old Testament was read in the Old Mass, and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, was during Holy Week, like during the Easter Vigil, and like a few places here and there. But the Old Testament was largely not part of the Old Mass. So what else changed? An emphasis on the homily as an important component of the Mass. So prior to Vatican II, the homily was optional for the most part. Especially during weekday Masses, priests rarely had a homily. Um, and even on Sundays, homilies were still considered optional. Sacrosanctum Concilium specifically 
calls out and says, no, the homily is an important part of the mass. Unless you have a good reason not to give a homily, you priest should be giving a homily. There was a restoration of the prayers of the faithful, which I don't think was specifically called in Sacrosanctum Concilium, but it became part of the new mass. And I called it out here because this is an example of one of those ancient practices that was in the very earliest documents that was not part of the medieval mass or the mass prior to the Council of Trent and had been pulled back from those patristic sources. Obviously, we all know this, right? An expanded use of the vernacular, meaning local languages like English for us, was used within the mass. Prior to Vatican II, it was pretty much entirely in Latin, with the exception of sometimes the readings would be done a second time in the vernacular, but other than that, the rest of the mass was pretty much all in Latin. Responses from the congregation to foster the, their active participation. So prior to Vatican II, the responses were largely done by the altar servers in the sanctuary or the choir. The lay people largely, like I said, didn't really participate. And there was kind of a push to get them to do the responses in the years prior to Vatican II. But since the new mass came out, it was more of kind of like an explicit thing that yes, these are the responses for the congregation. There were simplifications of the overall rite. Things considered useless repetitions were removed. So the mass by this point had become kind of like an amalgamation of many, many centuries of development and additions and subtractions. And what the intent of Vatican II was, was to say, let's look at what we have here and see if there are things that are like duplicated in mass. Are there like prayers that are repeated multiple times for no real reason? Like let's clean house a little bit, like keep the important stuff for sure. But there was a lot of extra stuff that had become part of the mass over the years that was stripped out. So a good example of this is for many of you guys who have been to a traditional Latin mass, you'll know that the beginning of the mass begins with the prayers at the foot of the altar, right? So the priest will stand at the front foot of the steps of the altar and say certain prayers. Apparently, from what I learned, that was actually, those were prayers that the priest used to say to himself prior to mass that somehow over time became inserted to be part of the actual liturgy. And so when Vatican II examined, okay, what's kind of an important part of the liturgy here, those prayers at the foot of the altar were deemed sort of a later addition that wasn't like essential to the liturgy. And that's why we don't do them now. The revision of the liturgical calendar. This is a huge thing that Sacrosanctum Concilium talks about to better emphasize the mysteries of salvation. So prior to Vatican II, the old calendar was very, very heavily based on Feast of Saints. That was sort of what propelled the calendar was all of these important feast days of all these different saints. The liturgical calendar post-Vatican II was stripped down is not the right term, but basically the idea was that the main thrust of the liturgical year should be the liturgical seasons, the incarnation and Advent and Christmas, and then like the passion, death and resurrection through Lent and through Holy Week and through Easter. Those should sort of be the main propulsion of the liturgical calendar, not all of these different feast days. So a lot of the feast days were stripped back and were made optional to celebrate in particular countries that might have strong devotions to those certain saints, but largely they wanted the laity looking at the calendar to go, oh yeah, this calendar is a celebration of the life, the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus primarily. Then we still have all of these feasts and other things going on. A renewal of RCIA. The RCIA program was kind of completely revised after this. And this is one that is specifically emphasized in Sacrosanctum Concilium. I know I keep waving this book like you guys can somehow look through it. A revision slash simplification of the divine office, also known as the Liturgy of the Hours, which is the highest form of liturgy, liturgy, yeah, I'm using that word correctly, outside of the mass. And there was a massive encouragement of the faithful to pr participate in praying it along with the clergy, right? So as a lot of you guys know, the Liturgy of the Hours are the set of prayers throughout the day that priests and religious are required to pray as part of um, being a priest or religious. 
Sacrosanctum Concilium specifically implores the laity to participate in this. And I think what the Council Fathers envisioned was sort of services in the church where the priests and religious would lead the laity in the Liturgy of the Hours. And this is one of those awesome things that were called for by Vatican II that largely never really panned out. Only now people are starting to look back and going, you know, that would be awesome for the life of our church. So hopefully this is this can be something that uh, our church picks up a little bit. And this was a specific directive of Vatican II. Okay. <laughs> things the council did not say about the liturgy. These are things that we often associate with Vatican II that are actually mentioned, especially nowhere in Sacrosanctum Concilium, and for the most part, not in any of the later Vatican II documents either. Mass is a communal meal, not a participation in the sacrifice of Christ. So in the post-Vatican II years, there was this heavy emphasis on a lot of the theology, especially from the paraconciliar theologians, that Mass was really more about a communal meal, not the sacrifice of Christ specifically. And it is correct to define the mass as a communal meal. That is okay, but it's primarily the sacrifice of Christ. And there was kind of an obfuscation of that a little bit in the post-Vatican II era. Another thing Vatican II never said, the priest should face the people from behind the altar versus populum instead of facing the same direction as the people in front of the altar, as had been common prior to Vatican II ad orientum. So Sacrosanctum Concilium does not say anything about this. It does not address this at all. Interestingly, though, both the Mass before Vatican II and the current Mass don't presume that the priest is facing in either direction. So the, the rites tell the priest certain times to face the people. So if he's already facing them versus populum, that means like look up at them basically. But if he's turned ad orientum, that means turn around and face the people and address them. And both the mass from prior to Vatican II and the current mass have instructions for both of them. I will say Father Blake makes his preference very explicit in his book. He specifically advocates for return to ad orientum. And I think he makes a really good case for it. It's an interesting conversation that's being had in the life of the church right now. But I'm just pointing this out as a misconception that Vatican II said, all right, face the people now. That's not what Sacrosanctum Concilium asked for. The third one, the laity should receive communion in the hand. This was never even, even conceived of at Vatican II, that this would ever change. This sort of evolved from what was originally like a liturgical abuse in certain countries that kind of the church eventually allowed to be permitted by bishops' conferences. So I don't want to shame anyone from receiving communion in the hand. Right now, the church permits people to receive communion in the hand. Who am I to say otherwise? I just wanted to point out that the church never explicitly wished that the centuries and centuries old practice of receiving communion directly from the priest onto your tongue was to be changed. Another thing the council never said, Latin should stop being used at mass. Latin is the mother tongue of the church. And when you read Sacrosanctum Concilium, it's clear that it envisions a liturgy in which both are used a lot. It doesn't say clearly when. A lot of people kind of interpret it to mean that the liturgy of the word, the proclamation of the readings and the homily and a lot of those things would be vernacular, obviously, but then the things like the canon of the mass, right? Like the Eucharistic prayer could be used in Latin as a way of maintaining like the universality of our church, one common language that unites us all. And to quote Sacrosanctum Concilium here, Steps should be taken so that the faithful may also be able to say or to sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary of the mass which pertain to them. Sacrosanctum Concilium also never said churches should be bare and simple and designed with cold modern architecture or called that relevance and simplicity is more important than beauty. All things set apart for use in divine worship should be truly worthy 
becoming and beautiful, signs and symbols of the supernatural world. The church also never said music should be more modern and relevant and that Gregorian chant and pipe organ should be sidelined. Said Contra, Sacra Sanctum Concilium actually says, the church acknowledges Gregorian chant as specifically suited to the Roman liturgy. Therefore, other things being equal, it should be given pride of place in liturgical services. And it also says, in the Latin church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem. So a lot of these traditional practices of the church were never meant to be abandoned by the, the reform of the mass. And I just kind of wanted to make that clear. To quote my hero, Bishop Barron, much of Catholic sacramental theology in the, in the immediate wake of the Second Vatican Council presented the Eucharist almost exclusively as a fellowship meal and as a merely symbolic manifestation of Jesus's presence. Witness the number of altars that became tables during that time, as well as the sharply reduced sense of devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. This dramatic emptying out of our churches, the destructions of altars, statues, pictures, stained glass, reredos, etc., finds an antecedent in Martin Luther, founder of the Protestant Reformation's revolutionary text on the Babylonian captivity of the church. To quote Luther, we must be careful to begin by setting aside all the later additions to the first simple institution, such things as vestments, ornaments, chants, prayers, organs, candles, and the whole pageantry of things visible. So to go back to Bishop Barron, even as it calls for a simplification of the liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium puts a special emphasis on art, beauty, music, and the visual dimension of the Mass. But in the popular implementation of Vatican II, Luther seemed to be more an inspiration than the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy itself. I think it's important for us to take a look and understand what Sacrosanctum Concilium really said, because it's... It's vastly different from what came out of the post-Vatican II period. Let's move on. Lumen Gentium, the light of the nations. That's what this, this um, constitution's name stands for. This is the dogmatic constitution on the church. Lumen Gentium, the light of the nations. This is the second constitution release. And this one is focused on what the church is. Let's get to know ourselves a little bit. That's what this document kind of says. So... It asks at the beginning, what is the church? And the answer it gives is the sacrament of salvation. So what is a sacrament from a Catholic perspective, right? A sacrament is a visible sign of an invisible reality, right? So think of like the water at baptism, right? It's a physical sign. It's something tangible of an invisible reality, this transformation that's happening on the person being baptized, this rebirth, this washing clean of their sins in both a metaphorical way and, and also a real way. The church as it exists on earth is a sacrament of salvation. To quote Lumen Gentium, in that body, the life of Christ is poured into the believers who through the sacraments are united in a hidden in real way to Christ who was suffered and was glorified. Lumen Gentium number seven. The visible church allows us a participation within the life of the Holy Trinity, a people made one with the unity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The church is a physical manifestation of our close-knit union with God and between all believers, right? Like it's an actual visible structure that exists on earth that is a representation of this spiritual reality of the union of all believers. So I think that's really beautiful. Lumen Gentium, in my opinion, is the most dense Vatican II constitution. There's so much here. And not only is there a lot, but it covers so many different topics. And going through this to try to decide what to present, I was like, I can really only give the highlights. This is probably the one to read if you're going to pick any Vatican II document to get a real understanding of the church. So let's move into a couple of topics specifically that Lumen Gentium covers. The first is the sole church of Christ. So a couple of these passages I'm going to be focusing on are some of the more controversial passages from Lumen Gentium, but here we go. So the sole church of Christ, quote, this is the one church of Christ, which in the creed is professed as one holy Catholic and apostolic, which our savior after his resurrection commissioned Peter to shepherd, 
and him and the other apostles to extend and direct with authority, which he erected for all ages as the pillar and mainstay of the truth. This church constituted and organized in the world as a society subsists in the Catholic church, which is governed by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. Although many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure, these elements as gifts belonging to the church of Christ are forces impelling towards Catholic unity. Okay, there's a lot there. Obviously, you can tell I have bolded and highlighted the word subsist in, right? And I'm going to I'm focusing on this because this has become a source of controversy over this specific passage. So, this use of the word the church of Christ, right? So like what this paragraph is trying to explain is what is the church that Jesus founded? The answer that Lumen Gentium gives is the church of Christ subsist in the Catholic Church. And this actually represents a change of language here at the Second Vatican Council. So prior to the Second Vatican Council, most Catholic theology would have said the Catholic Church is the Church of Christ. The Catholic Church is the church that Christ founded. This subsistence does represent a sort of development of doctrine from the Second Vatican Council. So what the use of this phrase means is that the Catholic Church is the church that Christ established. The church that Christ established, as well as the fullness of grace and truth, exists only within the Catholic Church, right? Only in the Catholic Church can you find the fullness of truth that Christ originally established. However, there are elements of sanctification and truth, and therefore the fruits of God's church that can and do exist outside of the visible structure of the Catholic Church. For example, within not just within other Christian communities, but that's mainly what it's referencing, but also out there in the external world, right? The idea is that the Catholic Church is the church that Christ established in all of its fullness, in all of its glory, in all of its truth. However, there are elements of that church all throughout the world. The best way to think of it is to think of the Catholic Church as sort of a font of grace and truth, right? This is where all the grace and the truth comes from. If you're right next to the fountain, that's the main source of the water, right? Like that is where the water is and where it comes from. But the graces and truth that come out of the Catholic Church, especially in the celebration of the liturgy, and find themselves all over the world. So There are other Christian denominations that teach things that are objectively true about Christ, right? So we can't discount that and say like everything that these other Christian denominations teach are wrong. There is truth in them, right? But what Lumen Gentium argues is that the source of all that truth comes from the Catholic Church. Anything that other Christian denominations or even other religions have that are elements of actual truth come from the Catholic Church. We are, as Catholics, the Church of Christ. But that's not to say there aren't elements of that truth outside of the visible structure of the Church. It just represents a change of perspective. It's not denying anything about the Catholic Church, and it's not even close to saying that other Christian denominations or other religions are anywhere near the same thing as Catholicism. Catholicism is the fullness of the grace and truth that Christ brought to the world to establish his church. There are just elements of it outside of there. Cardinal Ratzinger in 2000 said, with the expression subsistin, the Second Vatican Council sought to harmonize two doctrinal statements. On the one hand, that the Church of Christ, despite the divisions which exist among Christians, continues to exist fully only in the Catholic Church. And on the other hand, that many elements of sanctification and of truth are found outside of its visible structure. That is, in those churches and ecclesial communities which are not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church. 
But with respect to these, it needs to be stated that they derive their efficacy from the very fullness of grace and truth entrusted to the Catholic Church. However, obviously, the Para Council from post-Vatican II misinterpreted this, and they, they tried to sort of blur the lines between Catholic and Protestant based on this quote. And there were all these like weird examples of like allowing Protestant ministers to con celebrate the Eucharist with Catholic priests, which obviously makes no sense from a Catholic perspective. But this was part of that sort of intentional and unintentional misunderstanding of what this passage implies right here. Relatedly, another fun Catholic both and, and probably the most talked about passage of Lumen Gentium is its passage on salvation. So what well, Lumen Gentium 14 says, quote, basing itself upon sacred scripture and tradition, it teaches that the church now sojourning on earth as an exile is necessary for salvation. Christ present to us in his body, which is the church, is the one mediator and unique way of salvation. In explicit terms, he himself affirmed the necessity of faith and baptism and thereby affirmed also the necessity of the church. For through baptism, as through a door, men enter the church. Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Full stop. That, that seems pretty cut and dry, right? That the church is absolutely necessary for salvation. That, that's at least what that kind of implies to me, right? Like if you know the church exists and you refuse to enter it, there's no possibility of you being able to be saved because you're with you're removing yourself from the thing that Christ established to save people, basically. However, another fun Catholic both and right here. Lumen Gentium 16, just two paragraphs later, says, quote, those can also can attain to salvation who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or his church, yet sincerely seek God and moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will as it is known to them through the dictates of conscience. Nor does divine providence deny the helps necessary for salvation to those who without blame on their part have not yet arrived at an explicit knowledge of God and with his grace strive to live a good life. Whatever good or truth is found amongst them is looked upon by the church as a preparation for the gospel. As we previously established, although all grace has its source inside of the Catholic church, it's not necessarily bound by the visible limits of the church, right? So therefore it's possible but not guaranteed that people outside the church could receive graces that come from the church and could theoretically be saved by them. I just want to make clear, this is not universalism, right? This isn't the idea that, oh, okay, everyone can be saved then, right? Everyone's going to be saved. It's fine, right? To be clear, we don't know how many, if any, people outside of the sacramental life of the church will be saved. We just know that there are graces available outside of the church that could at least theoretically make it possible for somebody. There's a quote that Bishop Barron says a lot that I think really drives this home where he says, the sacraments are instituted by God, but God is not bound by the sacraments. God gave us the sacraments and said, you need these for salvation, right? Like especially baptism. You must baptize in order to be saved. But God, although he gave us the sacraments as the way of salvation, God is not necessarily bound to those sacraments himself. He's outside of those. It's a weird Catholic both and, right? Like where the church is necessary for salvation. The sacraments are necessary for salvation, but because we know that there are graces available outside of the church, it's not impossible to say that someone outside of the church could be saved. And I think the best kind of like thought experiment for this is the idea of, okay, what about a remote village somewhere where 
people are born and live and die without ever having even heard of the Catholic Church. No concept of the Church or Christ or anything. Would it make sense for a just and fair God to allow those people to be born with zero chance at salvation with zero possible access. It that doesn't make sense to me knowing who God is. So I guess it's like this this weird both and, right? Like where the church is necessary for salvation and evangelization is essential in our role as Christians and we're called to go out and baptize as many as possible. But at least theoretically you can't say that people who don't receive baptism or people outside of the sacramental life of the church are damned. And I just wanted to point out that obviously the para council misinterpreted this quote to mean that everyone is saved. We don't have to worry about evangelizing so much anymore, especially in the notion of like, it doesn't really matter what religion people belong to as long as they're a good person, right? Like that's kind of the, the zeitgeist that came from, uh, in those post-Vatican II years. That's not what these quotes say, and I just wanted to make that super, super clear. This last one, the, un the universal call to holiness, talked about by Lumen Gentium. So this is considered possibly the most revolutionary thing about the Second Vatican Council. So for most of the church's history, true holiness, like in the aspect of becoming saints, was seen at some, as something only really attainable by clergy and religious. And people saw themselves and clergy on like completely different levels, right? Only clergy and only religious had the time to devote in their lives to truly making them holy. Whereas for lay people, we kind of get up and go to work and die. We don't have time to perfect ourselves and we don't have the graces even to be as perfect as priests and religious can be. This was kind of the attitude in the church for long periods of the church's history. Vatican II radically changed this perspective. Um, and like I said, this might be the most important thing of the whole council. So to quote Lumen Gentium, thus it is evidence to everyone that all the faithful of Christ of whatever rank or status are called to the fullness of the Christian life and to the perfection of charity by this holiness as such a more human manner of living is promoted in this earthly society. And another quote, the classes and duties of life are many, but holiness is one. That's like bumper sticker material right there, right? And one more, every person must walk unhesitatingly according to his own personal gifts and duties in the path of living faith, which arouses hope and works through charity. So what Lumen Gentium is saying is that even in the most min mundane aspects of our lives, in the most, in, in Vatican II, it literally, Lumen Gentium specifically calls this out, in people's normal, boring, mundane lives of going to work and taking care of your kids and being married and just having a normal life, we are called to make those lives holy. Those lives can become just as holy and bring us to sainthood in the same way as the lives of priests or religious can. And it's just, it's an absolutely beautiful idea that like in the, the simplicity of normal day-to-day -day life, we can bring Christ into them and become saints. So like I said, Lumen Gentium is very all-encompassing. I'm just going to highlight a handful of other important things that come out of it. There's plenty that I didn't talk about. Take a read of it yourself, but here's a couple of other things. One thing that Lumen Gentium did is it reestablished the permanent diaconate from the early church, right? So prior to Vatican II, all deacons were just men in the transition of becoming priests. Lumen Gentium, because of its understanding of the early church and how that worked, brought back the concept of the permanent diaconate, which is why we have men, especially married men now, who are permanent deacons in the church and who assist at mass. Another idea from uh, Lumen Gentium is this idea of the common priesthood of the faithful. So what does this mean? So 
I think it's best to quote St. Paul on this. I urge you, therefore, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, your spiritual worship. This is very much in the vein of the universal call to holiness. So the word sacrifice literally just means to make holy. In a way, we're all priests because our priestly duty as men and women baptized into Christ is to make ourselves holy and in turn sanctify the world. That's how we render proper worship to God. So there's this concept of the common priesthood of the faithful. Make sure that you draw the lines though between the common priesthood of the faithful in this sense and the actual ordained priesthood, the priests who celebrate the sacraments and the liturgy, right? Two completely different concepts that, yes, the paracouncil did intentionally blur a lot of the times. The common priesthood of the faithful simply means that we are priests in the sense that we're called to make our lives holy and to bring that holiness to the rest of the world. The other um, thing I loved about Lumen Gentium, and honestly, I think maybe one of my favorite sections of it is towards the end, it talks about the church as the pilgrim church on earth. We're living in a world that will eventually pass away and the church, the flawed institution as it is, will only attain its full perfection in the glory of heaven, right? We're on a journey. Don't get too comfortable. The way things are now are not the way it's always going to be. And there's an amazing reflection towards the end about how we're united in a real way to the church on earth, us on earth, are united in a real way to the church in heaven and the church in purgatory. It doesn't explicitly use the the kind of more old school terms of the church on earth, the church militant, the church in heaven, the church triumphant, and the church in purgatory, the church penitent, the church penitent. But it's that idea, right? That the church isn't just us people on earth. It involves the communion of saints and the people in purgatory. We're all in this together. We all have a different role to play. And then for those of you who love Mama Mary, uh, Lumen Gentium's final entire chapter, it's a reflection on the Blessed Virgin Mary and her role in salvation history and her relationship with the church. And you can definitely tell there's a strong effort to defend the church against Protestant criticisms of the way we treat Mary, basically. It ends with an insistence to the laity to be strongly devoted to her and to re retain a strong sense of devotion to her. So that's Lumen Gentium. There's a lot of other stuff in there, especially about bishops, the Pope and his role and how the bishops get their authority and power and how that's shared amongst them. There's a lot of like more technical stuff about the church. Uh, I just wanted to highlight kind of the major point. Moving on, De Verbum, the third constitution, which means the word of God, the, dom the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. So like we talked about earlier, the study of scripture had boomed since the Council of Trent, leading for a need for the church to clarify major questions about the essence of divine revelation, sacred scripture as it relates to sacred tradition, the historicity and authority of scripture, and scripture's role in the life of the church, right? So a lot of this grew out of the sort of questioning about scripture and tradition that had become gun happening over the past few centuries based on uh, sort of more modern philosophy. All right, so divide, uh, De Verbum is actually by far the shortest of the four constitutions, like by far. Whereas the other constitutions, it's like definitely a sit down and read in multiple sittings kind of thing. You can literally sit down and read De Verbum like in less than an hour. Very simple. We need to talk about scripture and how it relates to our church. So it asks, what is divine revelation? The existence of God and things about him can be known by human reason, right? We know this through philosophy or through studying his creation. One of the main things that St. Thomas Aquinas argues, right? We can know about God without ever reading a word of the Bible. We can know that he exists. However, there are many things about God that are just not possible to simply know through our own reason. So divine that's where divine revelation comes in. Divine revelation is God's revealing of himself throughout history, which reaches its pinnacle 
in the incarnation, in Jesus Christ, the word made flesh. So to quote Dave Verbum, in his goodness and wisdom, God chose to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will by which through Christ, the word made flesh, man might in the Holy Spirit have access to the Father and come to share in the divine nature. Throughout the Old Testament, God spoke directly to the prophets to reveal different aspects of himself. But then with the coming of Christ, I mean, God literally manifested who he was right in front of us, right? And through his signs and wonders, but especially through his death and resurrection and eventual sending of the Holy Spirit, God made himself fully known to us. That's what divine revelation is in essence. And so the church defines Okay, where does divine revelation come from? There are two sources. One, sacred scripture. This is one. We all know this. Protestants love it too. We all agree on this. It's great. It's not just the, like, what it defines, what Dave Verbum defines sacred scripture as though, is it's not just a set of historical books written by human authors from different time periods. And this was sort of the popular understanding of scripture that had started coming to vogue over the last couple of centuries. So it tries to make this very clear. God is the primary author of scripture, but the human co-authors were chosen by God and are themselves to quote, true authors consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. That's what scripture is. But we also have this idea in Catholicism of sacred tradition, right? Divine revelation is not just from sacred scripture. It's not just from the Bible. It's from sacred scripture and sacred tradition. What is sacred tradition? The divine revelation and the authority to teach and preach handed over from Christ himself to the apostles and through the church. It's the living way in which Christ continues to communicate through his church as she continues to grow in a deeper understanding of salvation. We're not a sola scriptura church, to use the, the Protestant word. The Bible itself, like what books are make up the Bible, is itself part of the tradition of the church. So these two things are very closely related as far as our church is concerned. And to quote Dave Verbum, for sacred scripture is the word of God inasmuch as it is consigned to writing under the inspiration of the divine spirit, while sacred tradition takes the word of God entrusted by Christ the Lord and the Holy Spirit to the apostles and hands it on to their successors in its full purity, so that led by the light of the spirit of truth, they may in proclaiming it preserve this word of God faithfully, explain it and make it more widely known. So yeah, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, you need both. It can't just be scripture. That's what Dave Urban says. Sacred scripture in the life of the church. All right. So basically what this says, and I don't really want to dwell on this too much, sacred scripture should be easily available and accessible to all of the Catholic faithful and all of the Christian faithful. Good translations of it, the best possible translations we have of it should be in the hands of of us, the normal dumb lady, reading sacred scripture. And as you all know, well, not all of you, but as the joke often goes, we're Catholic. We don't read the Bible, right? That kind of comes from the ethos, from the way things were before Vatican II. Vatican II sort of said, no, 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 no. You guys need to be reading sacred scripture as well. Um, so not only encourages the faithful to read sacred scripture, but in a very uniquely Catholic way that I absolutely love. Dave Verbum specifically calls us to also study the church fathers alongside of sacred scripture and to, to be able to help us to interpret sacred scripture, right? So it doesn't become Protestantism where you read the Bible and, oh, what meaning do I get out of it? I don't know. This is what I think. My meaning's different than your meaning. I guess that's just how it is. Dave Verbum says, use the church fathers, use the teachings of the church and read the Bible alongside them to get to a correct understanding of them. Basically, so not only should everyone have access to scripture, but scripture should also be at the heart of preaching, catechesis, and liturgical instruction. And this is why, if you guys remember back to Sacrosanctum Concilium when we were talking about it, this is why the homily was so heavily emphasized, right? Because 
The homily is how you get the lay faithful to understand scripture, right? It's all related. It's all connected. It's like they knew they were, what they were doing or something. Just as the life of the church is strengthened through more frequent celebration of the Eucharistic ministry. Similarly, we may hope for a new stimulus for the life of the spirit from a growing reverence for the word of God, which lasts forever. That's Dave Verbum. Dave Verbum's very cut and dry. That's what I kind of like about it. To move on to the last and final constitution, Gaudium et Spes, which means joy and hope. This is the pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. So unlike the other three, so both Lumen Gentium and Dei Verbum are referred to as dogmatic constitutions, if you guys noticed, and Sacrosanctum Concilium is referred to as just a constitution, constitution on the sacred liturgy. Gaudium et Spes is the only one, and I'm pretty sure it's the only document ever in the history of the church referred to as a pastoral constitution. What does that mean? It's a pastoral constitution, right? It's taking the dogmas and the beliefs of the church and applying them in these real practical ways to the modern world. So to quote Bishop Barron, Gaudium et Spes, while having dogmatic elements and principles, has more to do with some of the shifting facts of this present time and is hence open to greater debate, right? We're not defining specific dogmas here. We're not even defining who we are as a church, what we believe about certain things. This is the church going, okay, we know what we believe. We know who we are. Now, how do we apply this to the modern world? And Gaudium et Spes represents a radically new outlook on the world for the church. So remember all the way back to my first slide where the church up until this point's source of engagement with the modern world was really one of condemnation, right? This is the church going, okay, different tune, modern world, you could use us and this is why. And that's sort of the underlying theme of Gaudium et Spes. Interestingly, unlike I'm pretty sure any document ever in the history of the church, this is addressed to the entire world, both believers and unbelievers alike. So this is literally meant to be picked up and read by anyone. And when you read it, it's very clear that the audience is not just for Catholics. It's literally saying, hey, you atheist, hey, you people who are Christian but not Catholic. Hey, you, people of other faiths. Like, it's not just for us as practicing Catholics. It's an open letter to the rest of the world. And one thing, one interesting thing to understand about Gaudium et Spes is that it takes the same perspective of grace found in Lumen Gentium. So remember back in our discussion on Lumen Gentium, we talked about the church as a font of grace, right? Grace is, especially through the celebration of the liturgy, come out of the church and fall all over the church, obviously, but also all over the modern world. So grace, even though it's not perfectly used by the modern world and it's not perfectly understood, nevertheless, graces can be found and truths can be found in the modern world outside of the visible boundaries of the Catholic Church. And that's a key understanding that leads to the writing of this document Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium et Spes is divided into two parts plus a preface and conclusion. It's a very long document. It is actually, fun fact, the longest document ever written by a council of the Catholic Church, like by far. But it's not a particularly difficult read either. So as wordy as it is, it's very readable. So part one is the teaching on man and the church's relationship to mankind. That's kind of what the emphasis of part one is. Part two specifies sort of urgent problems of the modern world and the church's perspective on them and proposed solutions. That's sort of a quick overview of, of uh, Gaudium et Spes. So the main sort of meat of Gaudium et Spes to kind of go from a high level because I could spend forever talking about all the intricacies of this is that it looks out at the modern world and it goes, what are the problems out there? And these are things that the church has talked about in the past but not in a let us help you solve them kind of way. That's where the tone of this document really changes things. So the church looks out into the world and it says, what are the problems with modern society? And it goes, meaninglessness, unhappiness, spiritual agitation caused by modern worldviews like atheism, a view of God as an arbitrary rulemaker who limits human freedom, 
the meaninglessness of human activity like work, materialism, the breakdown of the family and disorder in family life, advances in technology at a blisteringly fast pace with no clear direction, the perceived conflict between science and reason and faith, greed and the purely capitalistic ends of economic development and enterprise, poverty and inequality because of economic, racial, and social injustices, a culture of death including abortion, euthanasia, suicide, murder, genocide, etc., etc., rapid globalization, the challenges of cultures growing and blending together, politicians not serving the best interests of their people, genocide, war, and the arms race. This is a pretty exhaustive list of the problems in the world. And obviously there are more, but like the church is not tiptoeing around the real difficult problems of the world in this. The main thing that Gaudium et Spes asks of the modern world, right? How can we fix all of our problems when we don't even understand who we are? And the world is filled with all of these things that we don't even really know what to do with, right? Like we don't even know what the purpose of all this stuff that we have here. What's the answer you guys think? The answer is Christ, right? It seems simple and almost like, yeah, of course that's what the church is going to say, right? But Gaudium et Spes makes the argument that by only by understanding Christ, does everything in the modern world make sense? Do all the solutions make themselves apparent? So with Christ, mankind makes sense, right? So to quote Gaudium et Spes, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure of him who is to come, namely Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man, himself, man to man himself and makes his supreme calling clear. Quote, since it has been entrusted to the church, and this is where the church comes in, to reveal the mystery of God, who is the ultimate goal of man. She opens up to man at the same time the meaning of his own existence. That is the innermost truth about himself. The church truly knows that only God, whom she serves, meets the deepest longings of the human heart, which is never fully satisfied by what this world has to offer. Basically what this is saying, right, is that only with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it becomes clear that man created in the image and likeness of God himself is built to know, love, and to serve God and fellow man. And he has unquestionable inherent dignity that must be protected by the sheer fact that he was created for this purpose. This Gaudium et Spes paragraph 22 was a focal point of JP2's uh, pontificate. And actually, fun fact, JP2 was heavily involved in the writing of this document. So he was at the Second Vatican Council, even though he isn't really considered part of the Nouvelle Theology, like with all those other guys that I mentioned earlier, he was a big part of the Second Vatican Council and had a huge hand in the construction of this document right here. With Christ, mankind makes sense. Okay, we know who we are, and therefore the purpose of all things becomes clear. For man, created to God's image, received a mandate to subject to himself the earth in all its conditions, and to govern the world with justice and holiness, a mandate to relate himself and the totality of things to him who was to be acknowledged as the Lord and creator of all. Thus, by the subjugation of all things to man, the name of God would be wonderful in all the earth. The Holy Spirit frees all men, men so that by putting aside love of self and bringing all earthly resources into the service of human life, they can devote themselves to that future when humanity itself will become an offering acceptable to God. Basically what Gaudium and Spes argues in many, many words and using many, many examples is that all of these problems that we have in the world can be solved if man understands that he was created to love God and to serve others 
and that everything in the world is subjected to the common good of mankind. Gaudium et Spes just gives example after example after example of how we can take the teachings of the church and apply them into these real world situations and that only by understanding this about who we are and what the purpose of all things is can the solutions to these problems become evident. That's Gaudium et Spes. So the obvious question is, where do we go now, right? Great quote by Fulton Sheen here. The tensions which developed after the council are not surprising to those who know the whole history of the church. It is a historical fact that whenever there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, as in a general council of the church, there is always an extra show of force by the anti-spirit or the demonic. Even at the beginning, immediately after Pentecost and the descent of the Spirit upon the apostles, there began a persecution and the murder of Stephen. If a general council did not provoke the spirit of turbulence, one might almost doubt the operation of the third person of the Trinity over the assembly. So where do we go now in sort of like a bulleted list? So this is Father Blake's opinion. These are sort of the things that Father Blake says would be the direction our church should go now that we better understand the Second Vatican Council. So what can we do? One, realize that the council is still in the process of being implemented within the church, right? There are tons of examples of the church throughout history having these types of issues after the council. He quotes an early church father, I can't remember exactly who it was, explaining how shortly after the Council of, Emph of Eph eh, Ephesus, there was this kind of division into how, what exactly implementing the council means for the church. And we're not alone when it comes to the Second Vatican Council. So the solution isn't to run away from the council or to fully embrace what was actually implemented by the council. But it was, it's to understand that we're still trying to figure this out what Vatican II really called for and what that means to implement it. Learn about the council, read the documents for ourselves, right? I know I've mentioned like a hundred times to you guys, but they're super readable documents for you guys. I went in with a highlighter and just like, I mean, this book is now full of highlights at this point. Stop viewing the church councils and the church in general through the lens of secular politics. Liberal and conservative need not apply, right? This isn't a political organization. The future of the church isn't one person's opinion against the other. It's the guidance of the Holy Spirit for the future of our church, right? So that needs to be checked right at the door before we even start to have these conversations. This is one of the things that Father Blake really drives home. Reclaim the sacred liturgy, the lifeblood of the church from the para council and restore the liturgy to all of the beauty and all of the tradition that it deserves, right? As the most important thing in the church and literally as us attending the sacrifice of Christ in itself and all the majesty of that, right? Reclaim the sacred liturgy and everything flows out of that. Reclaim music, art, vessels, all these sacred things, right? That that the para council kind of took away. Like bring it back. Make our churches gorgeous again. Modern architecture be damned. Like let's make beautiful churches again. And make the churches that were built in modern simplified ways, we can make those beautiful sacred spaces. Catechesis. Catechesis is super important, especially through the study of the Bible and the church fathers, right? One of the things, as you guys saw, Vatican II wants us, the laity, to have a huge part of all of this, right? Know who we are. Know the teachings of the church. Read the Bible. Understand the church fathers, right? We're all part of this. To quote Pope, St. Paul VI, to close this up, who closed the Va Second Vatican Council like we talked about, quote, this secular religious society, which is the church, has endeavored to carry out an act of reflection about herself, to know herself better, to define herself better, and in consequence to set aright what she feels and what she commands. But this introspection has not been an end in itself. Rather, it was to find in herself, active and alive, the Holy Spirit, the Word of Christ, and to probe more deeply still the mystery, the plan, and the presence of God above and within herself. 
to revitalize in herself that faith, which is the secret of her confidence and of her wisdom, and that love which impels her to sing without ceasing the praises of God. Pope St. Paul VI at the closing address of the council. I know it's been long, but seriously, thank you so much, guys, for sticking with me through this. Real quick thing, I just wanted to call up um, the sources that I use. Things I would highly encourage if you guys want to learn more. Father Blake's book is a great starting point. Literally, especially for someone who is not the slowest reader in the world like I am, you could blow through this. It's a really easy read, and he makes the case really nicely. Read the council documents. I cannot recommend less like this particular edition by Word on Fire, the Vatican II collection. Not only are the documents in there, but alongside those documents are tons and tons of quotes from Bishop Barron and the four post-conciliar popes further explaining what the council was actually really getting at in these particular passages. It's awesome and really provides some perspective. So, all right, you guys rock. I'll see you soon. <laughs>